to speak about pornography today because we understand it as a key issue of the feminist fight. And in our opinion, without properly addressing the fight against pornography, we will not be able to achieve equality between women and men. We will not be able to fight colonialism, racism, lesbophobia, and pedocriminality because pornography is really at the root, at the basis of all of these domination systems. It is at the intersection of capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. Uh, it is basically uh, people, men, from the G7 countries, uh, because that's where the demand for pornography is, and it's also where the pornographic platforms are based. Mm -hmm. So it's men from the G7 country making billions out of the exploitation of the most vulnerable girls and women uh, in the world. Uh, so namely um, migrant women and girls, asylum-seeking women and girls, women and girls in zones of conflict and war, or natural disasters, and in all European countries, uh, young women and girls are targeted and the ones in the most precarious uh, economic situations. Um, what we want today is really highlight what is the reality of pornography, but also think about ways of action, concrete action against this system. Uh, because this is something that has been so normalized that, that today, um, most of us uh, in the world think that, okay, it's there, it will always be there, we cannot do anything against it, but there are a lot of ways in which we can act, and there are a lot of women across the world who are committed uh, against this system. So this is why we're going to explore different ways of action against it. But something really important for me before we start is to speak about what pornography actually is. So what do we see on the pornographic platform? Pornography is something that is everywhere in society, but we cannot talk about it. It's very taboo, so it's not being addressed. We cannot escape it, but we cannot address it. Uh, it's one third of the content online. Uh, and. Uh, there is a, actually a report from the Senate in France that recently showed that one out of three children below 15 have access to pornography and that on the pornographic platform it's 90% of the videos who show violent content. Uh, it shows gang rape, it shows torture and degrading, dehumanizing uh, treatment of women and girls, it shows torture, it shows um, uh, women who are being spat at, who are being peed on, who are being uh, beaten. So what is very important to say is that these videos are not fiction. It's not cinema, it's not theater, it's not a movie. Uh, what's happening in this video is actually being done to the women and girls that we are watching. So uh, obviously there is a very long uh, list of consequences for these women, both physical health, mental health, PTSD, suicide, femicide, disappearance, and so on. And the reality of the pornographic industry is that these are all crimes. Uh, it's international criminal networks uh, that could be held accountable with the legal systems that we have, that we already have. Uh, international law against torture, against degrading uh, um, treatment, uh, also human rights law, all of the framework against sexual exploitation and sexual violence, all of this should be applied to uh, the pornographic platform, but it's not because of freedom of expression, because some people would like to make us believe this is art, this is um, sexuality, but it's not. It's violence against women and girls. Um, so today we're going to explore different ways in which we can act against this system. So we're going to speak about advocacy, we're going to speak about the use of the law and legal action uh, to fight pornographic platforms through an example in France. We're going to speak about education, awareness raising uh, through writing of books. Um, we're going to speak about grassroots activism uh, led by survivors uh, of, this, um, of this violent system. And we're going to speak about how we can collaborate and unite across the world because this needs to be a global fight as it is a global phenomenon. And we cannot be alone in our own country trying to, to fight it. We need to, to gather. For instance, there is um, a coalition that has been created against MindGeek platform, which is based in Canada. 
so-called progressive country, uh, but actually uh, MindGeek owns most of the big pornographic platforms such as Pornhub, uh, Examster, etc. Um, and so women from Nigeria, India, Venezuela, Colombia, all of these countries that are targeted by sex trafficking for the purpose of pornography, uh, as well as uh, countries where there is an epidemic of sexual violence and gang rapes, and these rapes are being filmed and they end up on the pornographic platform Platform where French, British, etc. men can watch. Um, so all of these women have gathered to advocate towards the Canadian government against this platform. And this is the type of thing that we want to create here. So after the panel, we will have food brought to us and everyone can stay and we can discuss about how concretely we can do together uh, on this topic. But I will stop talking now. And before I give the floor to the brilliant speaker that we have today, we have a short video, which is a testimony of one of the victims of this industry in France. And she's being supported by Osé Le Féminisme, which is a French organization. We have the spokeswoman here, and we have also the lawyer of the organization. Um, so we just wanted to... Yeah, <laughs> but we wanted to, to, to show a testimony in order to truly set the, um, the tone and to truly understand the reality of what uh, these videos are. Okay, I think I'm going to read the subtitles. Do you think it's a good option? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so how to, did you get there? I was a young woman left on herself. I was in need of attention and love and in financial distress. I met a woman on social media called Axel, who was in reality a man. She arrived at this moment full of love and advice for me. She found that what I thought was a solution at this time, pornography. Then the pornographic mafia's trap closed on me. A uh, little bit later, I was in Normandy and I didn't know what I, that I was about to leave 48 hours of torture. So what happened during these 48 hours? During this weekend, I was subjected to multiple rape and sexual assaults. They took sadistic pleasure, bordering on horror. I was subjected to forced double penetration until I bled. Oral and facial ejaculation by surprise. Deep thoughts to vomit from. I cried, I said no, I rejected them. But it made them more violent. No one ever stopped. During 48 hours, they called me Burette, dirty dog, bitch. But never by my name. No one knew my name. <laughs> Pascal Lopé gave me his dog's food to eat. Why didn't you leave? Because I was afraid. I was surrounded by dozens of men. I signed a paper which I thought was a contract. I was in the countryside, I didn't know exactly where I was, I was supposed to be paid at the end of the weekend. And after those 48 hours, seven years after, I'm still there. I am a victim of cyber harassment and street harassment. During seven years, I was ashamed, I felt guilty, I had to justify myself. Those searchers thought that I remained silent because of the money. It's true, I kept quiet during seven years. But today, I want the shame to change sides. What do you want for the future? I want society to understand that I'm not the only one. The porn industry is only about rape, torture, dehumanization and barbarism. It's a criminal system which makes us believe that it is normal and okay. Today, I cannot be rescued. But I hope that my testimony and our fight will save women, young women and girls. <laughs> Ethic pornography will never exist. It has to be deleted and forbidden. 
So this is the reality of the many women that are being supported by Osé Le Féminisme and who are now pressing charges against uh, these pornographic platforms and their rapists. Um, so we have with us Ursula Le Men, who is a spokeswoman of Osé Le Féminisme, and she's going to explain the work that the organization is doing on this topic. So the Feminisme is an organization in France that exists all around the country. Uh, we are the spokeswomen living in very different parts of the country, and she's living in Brussels, so we are even kind of international. Um, we're a um, uh, general topic uh, organization, which means that uh, we're going to tackle and make advocacy or just uh, educational content about pretty much any subject that uh, touches women or impacts women or anything that has to do with male violence. Uh, we're not focused on one topic uh, specifically, but every one of them. But we are abolitionists and that's very important for us and that is always at the center of everything we do. Uh, we've been working for the abolition system in France uh, about prostitution for years and we've obtained in 2016, well, amongst all the other organizations, uh, the Nordic model in France. But we were uh, aware, uh, talking to each other, that there was that huge topic that wasn't really getting addressed, that is pornography, that is basically uh, film prostitution, but the fact is that it's 10 times worse for the victims because everyone can see it and everyone can masturbate over their rape uh, and they know it and the, the rapists and the pornographers they know it too and they use that against them we're going to talk about that a bit later so we started doing uh well just talking to each other and doing content about it and then uh well the um, cases that we have against the porn industry that Lorraine is going to talk a bit about later started too and we decided uh, really early on that we were going to uh, provide the victims with uh, lawyers, with a social worker, and uh, with psychotherapists because without uh, help, because uh, society completely let them down, it's, this fight is never going to happen. There are victims in the, in the procedures that have been trying to press charges for years and years and years, and no one wanted to hear them because they say, well, you're a porn actress, you cannot be raped. What they really want to say is that it's the job, right, being raped, and they know it. So that's what we uh, started to do. And along uh, all our work in the procedure and the legal system, we started to do advocacy too, because it has to be done together, right? And also because uh, to fund everything, uh, all those these lawyers and the, all the fees that we have with the procedures, we need the money and we need the money from the public institutions. So to ask them for the money, we need to do advocacy too, because otherwise, you know, if they don't understand why this fight is urgent, well then they're not going to found us. Um, so at the very beginning of the procedures, what we did, like kind of to start uh, the fight, we did um, uh, paper in the biggest uh, French journal, which is called Le Monde, which is kind of the Times here. Uh, and we asked a lot of feminist organizations to sign, but also of, uh, women in politics, so a lot of uh, uh, women from the Senate or the Parliament, or the, also at the time the women uh, minister, signed the, the paper and the, and the well, yeah, statement in the newspaper saying that uh, the word pornography hides a criminal system. That was uh, our point, and we started saying that, like first, um, putting the base uh, at first, and then we developed from there. So once we did that, we started to ask uh, a lot of meetings with uh, different institutions in France. So I will go kind of chronologically, chronologically. <laughs> don't know how to pronounce that, uh, but maybe it can inspire you if you have kind of the same institutions in your countries. So, first of all, the problem that we had is that the videos from the rape are still online and we cannot get them down. And that's something that's used by the pornographers against the victims, basically, when uh, well, part of the criminal system is to say, oh, no one is going to see the video, it's on a very exclusive website in Canada, and of course not, it's uh, on the, all the websites everywhere. And 
as she said, they are recognized in the streets, at work, everywhere, and they cannot escape the rape and the memory of it. So when they asked to take the videos down, the pornographer asked for money, way more money, of course, than they paid them, so thousands and thousands of euros, and of course, these women are poor women, and they cannot pay that, and it's extortion. So we tried to uh, take the videos down, so we uh, asked for uh, meetings with a uh, French administrative institution which is called La CNIL. So CNIL is an uh, institution who is in charge to control uh, the protection of data privacy, so like enforce GDPR that we have now in France. What we managed to do is to take down only the videos where the full name was showing, because they say, oh, that's a full identity, that that's an infraction of GDPR. But for us, I mean, it is a very narrow interpretation of GDPR because what GDPR says is that anything that can, um, well, that can identify you and first of all your face. Yeah. So, yeah. So we're still working on that, but that's uh, one of the first things that we did is to tackle through GDPR and uh, data personal, uh, personal data legislation to take the videos down. Uh, we also did work going to uh, an, another administrative institution in France, which is called CSA, which then transformed to ARCOM. Well, they all always love those <laughs> cycles, but uh, it's basically the same. So CSA and ARCOM, what they do is basically that they are the police of TV networks and internet. So they are supposed to enforce law uh, on TV networks and on the internet. So one of the laws that they are supposed to enforce is the fact that minors in France cannot, I mean, they should not uh, ac um, access pornography online. So the websites are obliged to uh, put some um, something that enforces the fact that the kids, the minors, cannot, have, cannot access pornography. It cannot be just clicking a case that says I'm over 18 anymore. Since then, 2020 in France, that's not... Uh, that's not sufficient anymore, they need to uh, put in place something that is effectively um, denying minors to have access to the pornography. So for that, we did a lot of uh, advocacy to CSA and then ARCOM, uh, asking meetings. Also, what we did uh, on all this process is putting pressure on them, meaning we uh, released a press release we uh, talked about it in the media, we talked about it on our social networks because we wanted to let the public know that they're not doing anything, even though they have, uh, by law, the obligation to do so. So that was also part of our strategy. And uh, so, so far, it's still ongoing, but we basically um, did not, um, Denounced 118 websites, pornographic websites, that do not enforce, I mean, none of them do, but that do not enforce the fact that minors cannot access uh, pornography online. So, so this is uh, right now happening because basically what they did, uh, the pornographers, their lawyers, uh, they did something that in France basically questions the constitution, constitutionality of the law itself. So we're going through that because they're saying it's breaching uh, the law on the personal life, uh, privacy, yeah, and other things, freedom of speech. Yeah. yeah. So that's one of the things that we did uh, to CSA. What we did too is that because uh, one of the heads of the one of the biggest French uh, in industry in France, uh, which is called Jackie Michel, is one of the biggest uh, French porn websites, and it uh, has a huge cultural um, well. It's, it's a household name. Everyone knows Jackie Michel. They have a slogan that says Merci qui, which means thank you who, so like Merci Jackie Michel. And they oblige the victims to say that at the end of the video, saying thank you. Yeah. And they have a t shirt saying Merci qui. So this is a very, very well known name in France. And of course, uh, they are in the, in what Lorraine will tell you, they are. They were the main uh, broadcaster of the videos of the rape. So we um, wrote to the district attorney and now they are being prosecuted too and the head is being prosecuted. So what we did once it was announced that he was being prosecuted is that we went to uh, CSA again 
and we asked for all the TV channels that, because of course they have TV channels on all the TV, uh, well, uh, yeah, I mean, the box, what was it? Box? You know, like uh, the services that provide TV, cable, whatever, they have the, the channels for porn of Jackie and Michel and all of them. So what we did is that we released press releases and we uh, asked CSA to uh, ban the channels from uh, all the networks because they are under uh, pro um, prosecution for rape, uh, trafficking and uh, torture. So we managed to take what we asked for, they took them down, but there's still more to go because they are, it's very tricky. Sometimes they are on video on demand, sometimes they are like a channel, like you can, you know, when you change channels, you have this channel, so you have to ask for all the videos on demand, but also for the channels, and since they create um, little less channels from the biggest one, we have to find them too, so yeah, it's a web of uh, criminality that we have to uh, find them, basically, if we are not going to ask for the channels to be getting down, they're not going to put them down, so we really have to find everything. Uh, then we also went to FAROS. So FAROS is a kind of um, organ from police in France who is in charge of uh, cybercrime, basically. So they, they are in charge to take down all the content online that is showing crimes or is illegal. For example, they are very active on terrorism. So we went to them and we said, well, you can go to any porn websites and found crimes and crimes and crimes. Why aren't you doing anything? And basically, what they say is that basically they have the competence for porn uh, or child porn showing children, but when we show them uh, videos that are obviously uh, showing children on the main website, like uh, or whatever, they say, oh, but we have no proof that she's underage, when it's obvious. So basically what they're saying, but not really saying, is that they're going to take down the content if the child is like three or four, but not if the child is like 11 or 12, because they say, well, maybe she's 18. So we're still, again, maybe putting media pressure on them because not doing much. And what we did too is that through their platform that they have to, any citizen can, um, uh, denounce illegal content online, we denounce thousands of videos through tags, uh, so like tags that are obviously torture, like uh, she's uh, passed out, beaten, whatever, and also the tags like uh, teen, and uh, they haven't done anything yet, so we're still same again, we asked the media to come when we did all the, all the things online, they were there filming us, they put that on TV, uh, and then months and months uh, after that, still they haven't done anything to the to the videos that we that we denounced. So, and what we what they're all doing, kind of, because you can see it's kind of, of the same network. You have on one hand, okay, they're dealing about data privacy. On the other hand, they're dealing about illegal content. On the other hand, they're um, uh, dealing with. Uh, uh, well, same with uh, CSA, illegal content too, and content that is accessible to minors, but really we're talking about the same content. Though what they usually do is that they're gonna say, oh, we're not competent, go to the other one, and then we go to the other one and they say the same. So we're kind of bouncing from one administrative institution to the other, but we're not giving up, and of course we're always public shaming them uh, on the media and or on our social media. And that's also a big part of our strategy that I'm not going to develop because I'm going to talk about advocacy. But uh, I can advise you that if you have a strong presence on social media, when we started talking about uh, the porn system, uh, we thought, okay, maybe we're going to have a backlash because on Instagram, maybe the people are younger and they are more with this uh, idea of porn is cool and porn is uh, sexual freedom. And actually what we found is the complete opposite. Okay. Is that uh, when we talked about these topics, always we had a lot of uh, people commenting and being on our side and saying, these young women were saying, finally, finally a feminist organization in France is saying that porn is violence. And that was a breeze of air, of air for us. And we're using that platform a lot to well, talk about everything that we do with those uh, institutions and our advocacy. And when they fail us, we tell them. 
and so they can them too for example i think we asked them to send a letter at some point to csr so we can also include them in our advocacy uh, the public that follows us on social media okay so then after all these uh, institutions in france what we also did is that uh, we started going to the well at the same time really but we started going to the public uh, the political uh, people so all the senators uh, parliament people and also the French Minister for uh, Women's Rights and so we again and again and again talked about this topic and I think uh, she well was aware that it was a huge uh, problem and that it was everywhere even the feminist organization who do intervention in the schools like, like we do but there is a lot or the feminist organization who works with victims in France they can uh, assess that there's a big issue there, like they, it's, it's everywhere in the schools. Uh, sometimes uh, men who are, for example, fathers um, who do incest on their kids, they use porn too in their strategy. So that, that uh, ring, rang a bell when we started to talk about this in meetings with the minister. And so we started to uh, ask her to do something, uh, ask for reports, ask for work, done by the political institutions about this topic because right now there was not much. There was work done on prostitution since a long time, but on porn it wasn't happening. So she accepted to ask the Au Conseil d'Egalité Femme Homme in French, so it's the High Council for Equality Between Men and Women, to do uh, the first work of the next um, a committee on pornography and she accepted so then we had a member of our organization who's called Celine Pic, uh, who's very instrumental on yes. everything that I'm saying here she would have to thank her for everything that, that I said earlier um, she joined the High Council of uh, Equality and she is now directing uh, the section about uh, violent male violence and so there are, she's directing as well like the, the work on the pornography um, report. report, yeah, <laughs> simple. <laughs> uh, so the High Council is also going to issue a report, I think, in one year, something like this. So we're going to have the main authority about uh, women's rights and uh, equality uh, doing a report on this subject. So it's, it's very important too. What we did too is talking uh, to the senators because we have a few senators in France who are uh, feminists, who are radical feminists, who are abolitionists, and so, so we, a few, but they exist. So they are leading the feminist um, commission in the French Senate, and maybe I think a week or two weeks ago, they issued a, rep a report on pornography by the Senate. So by the uh, French the. Women's Rights Commission of the Senate, they issued a report uh, about pornography. What they did is that they auditioned a lot of people who are, uh, well, either victims of the system or either, either women who are, well, supporters of the system, too. Uh, us, feminists, uh, psychologists, researchers, uh, legal uh, people like prosecutors everything so they they interviewed a lot of people and then they issued a, a, a report which is called l'enfer du décor so in it's kind of a pun which means uh hell behind the curtains if you will so it's very clear what they're thinking about the pornographic system and also from this we got a lot of press coverage so i mean since the start of the proceedings legal proceedings about uh, against the french industry the press has been very interested about this topic and it's been discussed finally because it hasn't been discussed yet. And uh, so we have the Senate who's now positioned against the, French, the sex industry and who is recognizing the fact that uh, porn is violence against women. Um, the old uh, French Minister for Women's Rights, uh, same position, the new one I think kind of Similar, we'll see, we haven't met her yet, but she's listening to us at least. And we also met uh, with uh, the president of France, uh, counselor about women's rights. Again, to talk about the same topic. Well, she heard us. 
uh, I don't know what will happen with that, but at least it has been um, such a fight that has become s so important in the French uh, public discussion that they, are, they asked her for a meeting with the uh, uh, advisor to the president. So they are aware of what's happening and they said that they support us. At least we get a little of public uh, funding from that that helps us uh, paying the lawyers, paying the psychotherapists, paying the social workers. And uh, something is definitely happening in France. So she, Lorraine will talk to you about the legal proceedings and the fight that we're uh, fighting and we're winning, I mean, step by step, but it's going in the, in the right, right direction. And uh, the advocacy that we're doing in parallel, that is very important too. Uh, it goes together, as I said, and I think we'll, you will talk about educational content too, same. I mean, it has to be a holistic fight, and we're all doing it together. Um, so I will now give the floor to Lorraine. Thank you for your attention. And thank you for, for speaking also about uh, teenagers and young, uh, young girls and young boys as well who are actually impacted a lot by pornography. In Ozelu Feminism, we do a lot of interventions in schools, and we really have this understanding that this is an issue for teenagers. and they actually are the ones bringing it up and saying we are fed up with this, why does this exist, what can we do, etc. Um, so we also focus uh, on them uh, and we wrote actually a book on feminist sexual education for teenage, it's targeted towards teenage girls, the boys can read it but we wanted to fill the gap that exists in sexual education where it's mostly focused uh, on boys' desire and pleasure, and for girls, it's mostly focused on be careful not to be raped, basically, <laughs> and not to get pregnant. So we wanted to speak about uh, female's body, female pleasure, masturbation, uh, abortion rights, sexual and reproductive health and rights, and obviously pornography has a big part in this, um, because we believe that what pornography does is creates a confusion between sexuality and violence. Yeah. Um, and this confusion is very hard to dismantle, for, for young girls and this creates the situation where when you cannot identify a situation of violence that you're going through you cannot fight it and you cannot say no you cannot say stop so it's easy to tell girls you need to protect yourself but if you make them believe that pleasure equals torture it's not gonna work so thank you for, for mentioning uh, what we do also with, with children and why it's important to speak about children when we speak about uh, pornocriminality and Ursula mentioned the tag team. Uh, pornography is pedocriminality. On the pornographic websites there is a lot of videos of children being raped. Um, it was, uh, there was an increase worldwide of six thousand percent of the pornographic content with children in 10 years. It's an increase of 60 percent since 2020, so it's exponential. It's crazy. And 62 percent of this content comes from uh, Europe. So, I mean, it's us. It's up to us to, to tackle all of this. Uh, anyways, going back to advocacy. Advocacy is not just these meetings with political uh, parties, uh, government officials, authority of administ uh, administration, etc. It's also taking the law and using legal action to change it. There are, like I mentioned in the introduction, some uh, legal framework internationally that already exists. The Human Rights Committee, Council of Europe, in their recommendation on combating sexism, all said that pornography is an obstacle for equality between women and men, and it is violence against women. It's also a form of sexual exploitation. So none of this is being applied until some amazing women like Lorraine Kessio, <laughs> who is not just lawyer of the organization, she is also the strategic mind behind all of this, a lot of this at least, um, and she's going to explain uh, the reasoning and the strategy uh, behind all of this. I would, I would like to start, maybe I was thinking, do I start by saying I have a dream? But actually I'm not a dreamer, <laughs> I'm a lawyer, I'm a feminist lawyer, so I will start I will start with, I make a bet. <laughs> Today I make a bet. In a few years, 
there will be no more porn industry. I know it sounds crazy, but it's happening. It's happening in France, and we, we, we came to get today here to ask you to do the same in your countries. Because what is pornography? Por pornography is an uh, unprecedented uh, tool of oppression against women. Unprecedented because, as my friends told you, the, my co-feminist woman told you, it's 136 billion images of rape, torture, hatred against women which have been viewed every day, uh, uh, every year in the world. It's huge, it's massive, it's unprecedented. Because we believe that, of course, patriarchy is a political system that oppresses women. And in order to make a political system of oppression live, you need an, an ideology. And this ideology is pornography. It is unprecedented because none of the oppressive systems before had the tool of internet. None of them had the capacity to enter into your house, enter into the hands of children, and, and condition you to become a raper, to become a rapist. And to condition you to hate the others, because even, you know, of, of course it's against women, but what is pornography doing? It's stealing, it's alienating their intimacy of people, it's breaking the capacity for us to have empathy one for the other, it's building the future soldiers that are going to kill and rape and destroy humanity. I really believe that. It is an unprecedented tool of oppression, of killing, of a mass killing. And all the reports show the link, the very st st uh, strong link between mass murder in the US, uh, terrorism in, in, in every country in the world, rape, pedocriminality, and this uh, instrument, this ideological, ideological instrument. So we decided to uh, well show that truth, which is actually very easy to prove on the on the uh, scientific grounds because we have those studies. A lot of uh, feminists who uh, uh, have already, like Gail Dines, who was going to shop on the camera, uh, written about it. We it's proven. We have scientific evidence. Of course, we need to. It's the first step uh, before acting uh, legally and uh, taking legal actions. You have to gather gather that knowledge, show that scientifically, based on uh, some hard science, medical science, um, uh, soci sociological science, uh, studies, uh, state studies, that it is harmful for the people that watch it and that it's criminal organization for the people who are actually leading those systems and that the victims are, of course, uh, harmed, injured, traumatized, raped, tortured. So this you have to gather it. If you don't, if you don't have those studies in your country, you have to start them. That's what we're doing in France. We we we, we have international studies. It's not enough. No no problem. We're going to start those studies, and we're starting them in, in order for their studies to be ready the day the trial will arrive. And the trial is going to be in two years, about the first one, because there are going to be a lot. I can tell you. <laughs> it's, it's, but it, it is it's, it's a huge revolution, huh? and uh, all this was organized uh, uh, in, let's say, uh, underrooted organs, It's like a bit hidden. It's been ages, actually. Feminists have been waiting for that day. I can tell you, because. None of this could have happened if there wasn't uh, people struggling before, if there were the organizations that actually listened to the women who, who were harmed and that have been talking about the pornographical system for ages, all the survivors that came in their NGOs, some NGOs in which I was a, a volunteer, and we heard and we knew and we were waiting for the moment, for the good moment, and the good moment is today, it's now, it's happening. and so. I mean, I recall, like in, in 2016, uh, 16, a lady came to see me and said, "Yes, this is what happened to me," and it's like the main, um, the main site, the main uh, website or uh, pornographic, pornographic system um, in France, which is called Jackie Michel, who actually did that to me. The videos of my rape, I was drugged, I was raped, I was tortured. Uh, it was uh, my pimp that brought me there, I didn't know what was going to happen, and it ended up on the internet, and ever since my life is broken. This was in 2016. And I remember I said to that woman, if we find a second victim, we'll go for it. We found more than six a second, actually. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And so I can't tell you everything how it, because of course a lot of it, of it is protected by 
uh, the, the secret which is related to the instruction, the criminal procedure which is, which is going on. So I cannot tell everything, of course. But at the end of the day, it's happening. There, we, we have the, the main, I mean, none, no, not one single person in the porn industry today in France can sleep on his pillow the same way. I can tell you that. Not the same way. Those men have been uh, going on, torturing, making fun of torture, having sadistic behaviors for so long and thinking that they had so much impunity that they left so much evidence. And that evidence, we have it. It's in the procedure and it's going to come out. And it's going to bring them to jail. A lot of them are already in jail. It's like it's ex extremely exceptional. You know, you know how the patriarchal judicial system is. You can rape a person and you won't go in, in, in jail, or you're going to be slightly punished, or uh, you, at least you won't have any uh, provisional uh, detention. But we have provisional detention for almost all of them. Some of it's, they, they are in jail right now. And they have not been judged yet, and that means something. Is they're going to take? They're going to have? They're going to be charged a lot. And some of them, uh, the 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 incrimination of rape with torture and barbarism act have been have been uh, uh, chosen by the public prosecutor. It's not one yet, but if you want that, the jail sentence is a life imprisonment. And we're going to struggle. We're going to struggle for every one of them. And 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 when you hear those people talk now, they think it's the end. It's the end of. Uh, they're all trying to find a way to get out, to put their money out of France, to change, to try to adapt. They're of course the system is reacting. They're putting on the on the front scene uh, people to say ethical pornography. We yeah. Uh, uh, of course, women who who have that double. Uh, they're victims, of course, but you know get to, to advocacy for the ethical form of torture and, and, and oppression. So we, we know that, we are used to that. But thanks to the fact that France has already been through this ideological debate because we became abolitionists in 2016, people are less, uh, are, are less eager to hear that, are not believing that, are more, have more critical sense. So it's, they're not, it's not working that much. They're trying, like today again in the, in the main newspaper we had, uh, we have a, another paper of people saying, yeah, well we think it's possible to uh, dissociate uh, pornography and crimes and so on and so on. Of course, it won't work because we can prove materialistically that it is actually only crime. It is crime in the organization, it's a crime in the, f in the way that they recruit the way that they uh, torture, the, the procedures they put to, uh, to manipulate the women, and of course the, the acts that those women have been, uh, uh, or the rapes and the tortures that they, they've been through, but it's also crimes with regards to the, the product of, the, of the, the, the hatred speech which is actually uh, driven through in, in pornography. And, we, we can, and this is the, the next step we're into, because we have two main uh, criminal procedures which are open in front of the Paris uh, criminal uh, criminal jurisdiction. So it's like they're huge cases. One has only uh, two years of investigations already and it's two more years before the trial. The other one just started now and it's going to keep on going and going. And there are a few other ones which are going to happen as well because we introduced the files but they're not, you know, they're not uh, in, they're not in pro processing yet. So they're going to be a lot. but. This is with regards to the, the well, let's say the, the, the first criminal, well, the, the pornographers as such, like the people who recruit the rapers, the actors, very important. The actors are also in jail too. Not only the people who, were, who recruited, the people who, who filmed, the, the, uh, the produ produ productors, but the actors as well for rape, rape, torture. They're all in jail. So this is the, was the first step. It's, it's maybe called the first step, or well, one of the first steps. And now we're t we're addressing the content. Uh, we, there's a lot of legal instruments, and, and, and European legal instruments, but French legal instruments that say that hatred speech is not allowed. So how come pornography is still there? <laughs> so that's the question we're asking. We're legally asking. We're asking. We demonstrate that 
well, we have to fight because it's an ideological fight. Because some people will say that you know, insulting a woman of whore is not an insult; it's embracing the stigma or shit like that. So <laughs> <laughs> we have to fight with you know some very uh, absurd arguments and a lot of, of course, complicity. Because I don't think that people really believe that it's inversing the stigma. I, I, I really saw that I, I really believe that people, you know, they're very happy that women can be insulted and raped and, and actually. Uh, uh, dehumanizing society. So we're just like, we're at that level. We're, we're just demonstrating, and it's extremely simple what we did like lately, was, uh, because I also have to give tribute to the, because that's how we organized, to the more than 30 uh, very brilliant women lawyers which we, uh, we recruited and work with us. Because of course, uh, all the women that, uh, that that came to us, which were victims in the criminal procedures, had to get lawyers. So we recruited young feminist lawyers, that some of them just started being lawyers, but they're much more efficient than some of the lawyers <laughs> were men, and have been working against women for more than 30 years, and I can tell you they're really badass. So we have all the, the, those women who are helping, and some of them are, are, are also collaborating and trying to, at, the, at the, a more strategic level, and so what we did together is that we, we hired um, uh, our Ministry of Justice, I don't know how you say that, but uh, like some official uh, of a judicial um, whatever agent that you know captures on the internet what's on the website, just what's there. We don't need to investigate more than that. We just make official uh, captures of every website, like the five major ones, Xvideo, Pornhub, uh, Amsterdam uh, and all those uh, all those videos, and we take every content image. Well, we put the, the dates, of course, to see when it was uh, it was downloaded, and every content and the text which is with it. And it's, I mean, it's like so obviously hate. It's like so obvious. Like who could say it's not hate when it's like some speeches like this uh, uh, Arabic woman who raped. Uh, to eat, or this Arabic uh, is going. Uh, Arabic woman is going to uh, suck dicks till she st till she vomits or stuff like that. It's that crazy. It is crazy, and it's on every every page. You just have to open. You don't need to seek for it. It's just there. So this is the what we're doing now. We're just making capture of all those websites. We don't know all the victims on those websites. We're not we're not on that stand anymore. Now we're just going on for the speeches, and we're going to describe in and how every single one of those speeches and every single one of those images are uh, uh, frankly uh, uh, infringing the international law and the national law that prevents and, and forbids hatred speech online. And that that speech cannot be protected by the freedom of speech because there is very clear uh, jurisprudence with regards to freedom of speech. Freedom of speech only protects speeches which are compatible with our social contract, humanistic social contract. Hatred speech is not protected by the, by the, the European Convention of Human Rights, and it should not be protected in, in internal right, right as well. So we are totally entitled today, with the judicial tools we have, we don't need to do any uh, further modification, well, we will ask for some in order to do it, to, to make it go easier, of course. But with the with our, our, our criminal code today, we're able, in our perspective, and that's what we're doing actually, to prosecute not only the people that do porn, but the, also the pornographical uh, images which are in, on the internet. And we are really organizing for that. And what we really need, and that's why we're here today, is that you do the same in your countries. That you realize that today it's the moment when pornography is going to crumble and collapse forever. It is today, it's now. And if we don't do it, there's no chance we succeed in any other of our struggles. Because the ideological fight is the first step before the, the, the because it's the, conti the violence continuum that you all know about. There is no violence if there's no idea of violence. And the idea of violence is actually promoted through pornographical system. So if we don't struggle against that one, it is the beginning. And it, as I told you, it's so powerful. We have to do it. We have laws to do it. And it, we have some uh, international legal uh, uh, texts that actually can help us. Uh, we have to, to, to work together in order to produce more studies in order to uh, fight and make this struggle on the top list of our, of our, of our uh, fights, our feminist fights, but not only feminist, anti-racist, I mean it's intersectional, anti-classist, it's the same. There's a lot of videos which
literature actually pointed, of course, measured massively against uh, uh, people, uh, women from uh, ethnical groups, of course, but massively, of course, against poor people. I mean, what is lo looked for is actually the capacity to degrade the more possible, and if you can degrade the people who are the more vulnerable in society, well, it's even better. So we have to also create, uh, uh, if it's possible, because it's not always possible, we all know that a lot of the... Um, let's say, uh, either anti-racist uh, uh, anti or anti, or let's say, left-wing uh, uh, NGOs or uh, political parties are, are macho-socialists or macho-racist, anti-racist, and sometimes don't want to actually really look at that subject and are sometimes even our enemies. So this, we actually see, seen it in France, huh? We, we, for the moment, we're more, a bit isolated, but we're working on that side, and, and try to address this question as a, pr a political priority, a real political pr priority, because with regard to the means, I mean, as I told you, it's like 136 billion images which are visioned each year. It is crazy. None of those school... Uh, uh, classes or three hours of class on, uh, on sexual equality or sexual uh, pleasure and will we'll never be able to balance like 100 and, uh, 136 billion image wash every year. It's the soldiers, the rapist soldiers which are actually conditioned with that. So really we have to address this and we have tools to do it and we are more than eager to give you uh, more or less uh, some uh, tips because uh, I can tell you that I mean it's extremely possible. The French law is not better than yours, I can tell you. It's the same. It's as patriarchal and uh, as racist, so don't worry. It is, we can do it. We can do it. Something that Lorraine said that I really relate to is, for me, the idea that pornography is the school and the legitimation of male violence against women and girls. And in my opinion, this goes through dehumanizing, because in any system of domination, you cannot justify the violence if you haven't dehumanized the people who are going to go through the violence. Um, and for instance, when war is happening in Ukraine and what you see trending on pornographic websites is Ukrainian girls, Ukrainian women, that's dehumanization. In India, when a 10 years old a girl is gang raped and then uh, found dead, cut in little pieces in the trash, and then her name becomes the top trend on pornographic website, that's the humanization, and so on. So this is what uh, pornography is doing, and through our work, yes, and yeah, through also what Ursula is saying, the fact that the victim is never named, uh, she's called bitch, dog, Burette, which is in French, uh, racist slurs uh, targeted towards Arab women. And so to fight this dehumanization, the grassroots work with survivors is key. Uh, and this is how we got the abolitionist law in France. And this is, I think, how we will achieve um, the fight against pornography as well. And through the work that Ursula and Lorraine presented to you, we are engaging with the victims and as you saw through the video they want to be heard they want to speak and when they meet each other it brings back their humanity their capacity and their agency to speak out and that's why we really wanted to have a talk about grassroots uh, survivors led activism today and that's uh, what Natsuki Kato is going to to talk about she's a social worker for PAPS in Japan right and I will let her uh, do her presentation. Thank you so much. I will be talking about uh, sexual exploitation in Japan. Um, after listening to all these like powerful women from uh, from France, I I'm really um, flattered actually, and I feel sorry for putting all these like horrible stories. Uh, but um, I really need to put it out there and uh, start thinking about what we can do from there with you guys. I'm a case walker from uh, PAPS, an organization for uh, the survivors of sexual violence, sexual exploitation, and pornography. Uh, we run a 24-hour hotline, and we provide clients with consultation services. A lot of our clients need help with their sexual images to be deleted on the internet. So we have a team of women who are dedicated for searching for the images of the clients and uh, delete them. 
and we also have activities that called outreach. Uh, we um, basically like walk around in the red light districts of Tokyo to, at night to give out handouts to those women and girls out, uh, out on the streets. They're, um, most of them are um, involved with uh, sex trade somehow, pornography, and also a sugar daddy kind of things. So um, we, gave, we gave away uh, free food and drinks to them and uh, make sure that they, ha they know um, there to where to call when they have when, when they are in need of help. Um, we also have a advocacy and a lobbying team to educate people on the issue and make changes. So let's talk about um, our consultation service. Um, as I said, we run 24-hour hotline for those who we, those who need um, help and assistance with the image-based sexual abuse and also with the problem regarding sex trade, such as porn industry and prostitution, they can only reach. Uh, they can also reach out to us um, via email and messaging app called Line. Um, let's take a look at the number of the clients um, each client each new each in each year. Um, these are only the new clients who call us in each year, but um, you can see like you skyrocketed after 2021, which is when we got a major exposure on the TV shows uh, because the medias are paying attention to the por child pornography more than ever now. And we had a big exposure on the TV, so that's why a lot of um, teenagers are the ones who um, contributed to the huge growth of the past two years. Uh, we have about um, 2,200 clients in total ever since 20, uh, 20, 2012, which is the opening of our consultation service. And so far we have about uh, 600 cases of um, adult video survivors. So, oh yeah, we I, I keep saying adult video maybe, but adult video is uh, pornography pornographic videos in, ja in Japan, that's what we call. Um, and uh, so what kind of things that adult video victims tell us on their first contact? So common things that they say is that I appeared in adult video years ago and I kept it to myself until now, but I'm scared to death if anybody finds it out of my video and notices it's me. Or some people tell me um, I found out that that video appeared. I appeared. It's sold, posted everywhere online. They didn't tell me any of this. Can you help me delete them? Um, or some people say uh, someone blackmailed to my colleagues about my adult video from the past, and I was left with no choice but leaving the job. Things like that. And common phenomena we see is that many of them. I'd say 95 to 98% of them say that it's their own fault. They say that um, I should have known better or I was too ignorant to get myself into this or something like that. Uh, about three main actors in the adult video. One is the uh, adult video actress agency. Uh, in most of the cases, adult video actresses, what they call actresses, are assigned to adult video agency. And the second one is the adult video filmmaker company. And the third one is the web service company, which that's the um, platforms where adult video makers sell the pornographic videos on. Um, so let's, let me share a couple testimonies from the clients. So a woman, I would call Sarah. Sarah was, oh, this is a real picture from 2016, it's kind of old, but um, it's this, what we call a scout, which is basically a pimp in the middle of Tokyo. Uh, Sarah, one day, when, when she was walking down the street of Tokyo, a man, uh, the scout or pimp, which is pimp, uh, came up to her and said that she's so pretty that she should um, register for his model agency. And she declined, but the guy followed her along the red arrow all the way. That she got eventually scared that she, like he would follow her home. And she gave in finally and decided to just have a chat with him. He takes her to his agency, small room, um, 
and three other men are awaiting in the room and surrounding her. Um, she keeps declining to register for their agency, but the men kept convincing her to join his agency. So at, so at least uh, it's past midnight, she was so exhausted, and then also she got worried that she might miss the last train home, so she gave in and signed the contract without reading it too much. Um, a week went by and a scout guy, the pimp, called her and said that you get an offer from the filming company. So she um, told him again that she doesn't want to do it and then this, the pimp guy says, okay, I understand, so just come to the uh, office one, more, once, one last time and then we can cancel your registration. And then she, she went to the office and then got raped there and then filmed and then it was sold as an adult video. The other case, uh, let's call her uh, Lena, she was a college student back then and she wanted to go on a trip with her friends during the vacation, so she needed a little bit of money. So she searched on the online um, high income part-time job and she finds a website which says all you have to do is monitoring some new products and answer surveys and part-time or Body parts more wanted. Just come to the interview, you get like a three thousand Japanese yen. And she contacted the company and went to the interview. And uh, and one man and then two, uh, oh, um, a woman and two men escorted her to their office room and uh, explained to her that they only have adult video uh, job to offer her at this moment even though they do have modeling, uh, other modeling jobs, which are probably a lie. Um, and uh, she, she was surprised. She didn't know that they would offer her something like that. So um, it, was, but it, it was really hard for her to like, be assertive in the situation where she was like, surrounded by three other uh, people. So she said, like, oh, well, I'm not sexually ex experienced, so I won't be suited. Then um, one of the men say, well, it's actually better if you're inexperienced. Those girls are more high in demand. And she goes, well, actually, I just don't want to take my clothes off or do, like, sexual things. I'm not good at that. Um, and then one of the men goes, like, oh, wait, what, like, are you saying that we are doing something wrong here? Like, this is our job and we take pride in it. Uh, are you looking down on the adult video actresses or us? And then she goes, no, it's not like that. I mean, like, I don't want my family or friends to find out. And the man goes, um, well, what makes you think you can be pro like popular like that? I mean, like there are hundreds of adult videos produced every month, and there are actresses that are thriving to get popular in this industry. What makes you think you can get popular right away? And it's just like that, like they um, they deny every reason that you say to them that they don't want to do, and to the point she doesn't have things to say to them. And um, also, they convince you by saying, like, you get a professional makeup done, so no one's, no one's going to find out it's you, or uh, it's only sold overseas, so no one's going to find out. And uh, she gave in at last and signed her contract. On the same day, they took a picture of her uh, naked as a profile picture. Um, and a couple weeks later, the agency called her and said that she got an offer, and then she was told to come to the studio for the shoot. And then if she doesn't want to, if she doesn't do it, then it'll co cost her cancellation fee. So she goes to the filming studio crying. But the filmmakers say that all of these staff are booked for you shoot today, and you cannot bail on this. It's work. That's what they say. The phrase many clients say in common, recalling the time they were, shoot, they were um, filmed, um, they say, I lost myself while the shoot. It is also not rare that women got pregnant or STIs, mental illness, in adult video filming. Um, one episode I just cannot 
forget is that she, um, this one woman, got um, multiple STIs through the adult video filming, but um, the agency and the makers cheered her up and encouraged her and hang in there to hang in there. She appeared in more videos. They also like pour this fake semen, uh, which is a mixture of like a smashed banana and egg into her vagina, and filmed her like vulva up close as it's like dripping out of her vagina to say like um, the men came in her, and you know the scenes like maybe you've seen those scenes, but it's not even like considered a torture porn or like abusive porn. It's just like a common genre that where like women are, you know, um, um, yeah. So um, she recalled the time and say um, that I kept pulling my hip away in pain as the intercourse gets rough. But the director said, um, could, you, could you not pull your hip away because it's not a turn on for the viewer. This is not even, <laughs> yeah, abusive porn but it is happening, the abuse is happening, um, even in the soft vanilla themed um, porn. So we perhaps have 600 of those episodes so far, and but we know it's only the tip of the iceberg because Japanese adult video industry is huge. And we also have like amateur adult video creators as like, as, like in compared to like, uh, the big companies, so the situation is pretty horrible. But we are resisting, so uh, exploitation in Japan is pretty horrible, but um, uh, here are some of the achievements we perhaps felt in the last decade, um, like child sex spying and chi child sex law has been passed in 2014, and um, a lot of uh, women-led demonstration against sexual Violence it has been happening uh, since the 2017, inspired by the Me Too movement, and also um, a lot of like uh, sexual violence cases in Japan, like that are um, fighting back against the sexual abusers. And rape law has been reformed for the first time in 110th years in 2017. Uh, and also, uh, what I really want to highlight is the last one, 20. 22, Japan passed adult video law, which prevents the coercion and exploitation in the industry. It's not um, enough, but uh, it's a huge progress. Uh, and we, yeah, I want to explain a little bit more about the prevention law, adult video law, but um, in basically like it enables performers to like cancel the contract during a certain period of time, regardless of the con uh, condition or other things to protect, like, to protect the performers, even though it doesn't ban the intercourse during the film or the real sex act or uh, violence as much as, like, other um, things. Like, it only, like, focuses on the contract and, and how it's made, but uh, it's a huge con uh, contribution. It's a huge progress that we're achieved. We have achieved in the last year. So, but yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so now we're going to listen to Melinda Tanja Rice, who uh, co-founded the grassroots campaigning movement Collective Shout for work free of sexual exploitation. That was two year, 12 years ago. Uh, Collective Shout has had many successes against companies which objectify and sexualizes. Uh, girls for profits and has fought for restrictions on the sex trade in Australia and collaborated with global partners in campaigns, including against Pornhub. Melinda also speaks regularly in schools, helping young women challenge the harms of a pornified world and the sexist behaviors of porn influencers. <coughs> so I'm going to keep it brief because, uh, because of time and because I'll be going into more detail on these issues tomorrow. Uh, my colleague Kate <laughs> Roper and I uh, doing a whole session on organizing campaigns. We'll be unpacking in detail some of the campaign victories that we have had in Australia. In 2020, we had, uh, uh, 2021, we had 20 victories just that year alone. We're a very small team, uh, five, five women, and we run a campaigns in Australia and globally. And in that year, we had uh, 20 victories. Seven of those were global. Uh, one of them was against a multi-trillion dollar corporation, Alibaba. We got child sex abuse dolls, replica children, babies, infants, 
lifelike, anatomically correct. We got 23 uh, sellers, factories selling those dolls on Alibaba, the biggest shopping platform in the world. We got them all removed in just a few, few weeks. Three porn magazines bought down in Australia, Zoo Weekly, a picture magazine of people. Picture and people were in Australia for 80 years. We got rid of them in six weeks. All we did was put the photos of the executives of Bauer Media Group all over Twitter. With the pictures from the magazines, promoting, promoting uh, rape and uh, violation of schoolgirls, uh, racist content. Uh, we just put their photos up there with the images from the magazines and six weeks later those magazines were gone. We'll be sharing that in more detail tomorrow. Uh, as well, we are currently running some campaigns where we are calling on uh, Playboy shareholders to divest from, uh, from Playboy. So we are calling on Bank of America, JP Morgan, uh, BlackRock Vanguard Group to divest uh, from Playboy. We were also part of the a global campaign against a porn hub and I was part of the briefing of the executives from MasterCard and Visa uh, with our global uh, partners and as a result of that global uh, briefing MasterCard and Visa decided not to uh, process transactions for porn hub I was asked to mention uh, our books and so uh, I've only bought uh, two to show you, but the rest are on the, the book table here. Uh, I authored Getting Real, Challenging the Sexualization of Girls, uh, also Prostitution Narratives, Stories of Survival in the Sex Trade, with my uh, dear uh, colleague, Caroline Norma, who is a friend and a colleague of Nat's here. Um, first person accounts of women who have left the sex industry. And then this book, Big Porn, Inc., co-edited with my uh, friend Abigail Bray, who's now living in... Uh, France, exposing the harms of the global porn industry. Uh, Gail Dines has a chapter in here, uh, Sheila Jeffries, other amazing women, Robert Jensen is in here also. And then a very new book that I have the privilege of launching here tomorrow, He Chose Porn Over Me, 25 accounts of women harmed by men who use porn, first collection of its kind uh, in the world, also published by Spinifex Press. How good is Spinifex Press? Yeah! Um, So this book uh, really is to show the lived experiences of uh, women harmed by compulsive porn using men. It really links uh, uh, porn and violence against women. Porn as a driver of violence against women, a driver of sexism, coercion, misogyny, uh, trauma, suffering of women. It's all here in their own words. Australian stories, women from the UK, uh, US, um, Netherlands. Um, so you might want to have a look at that. We are launching that tomorrow. And uh, Caitlin Roper, my colleague, is uh, launching her book tomorrow also. Sex Dolls, Robots and Women Hating uh, by Caitlin uh, Roper. Uh, this is a, a book that uh, was actually one of the most, most shocking books I've read and I spend my life doing reading terrible things. But uh, that, that book is right up there. That's not a good endorsement really, is it? But really, <laughs> I do recommend, I commend that book uh, to you. Uh, some of our other work in Australia, we are pushing for proof of age protections, age verification system, so that children can't enter rape porn, torture porn, statism, incest at the click of a button. And uh, we've been inspired by what you've achieved in, in France and um, some other countries are rolling this out as well. Now, we had our previous federal government, which was a coalition government. Uh, it had agreed with us. We've been pushing for some kind of protections for children, for a decade and the previous government instructed the e-safety commission to come up with a plan to address um, protecting children from exposure to porn to come up with a plan by the end of this year and we are quite worried now about this plan because the sex industry which wants no restrictions at all they need to build the next generation of porn consumers that's their business model and this industry in Australia is very powerful and this industry is, I've been sitting on stakeholder round tables, uh, co government consultations on this issue, and given equal weight to all of the uh, child and young people uh, advocates on these round tables, equal weight is the sex industry, which has caused this whole problem in the first place. 
they are treated as equal to us. And in the latest consultation documents that we have read, uh, they are given a, a first quotes, slabs and slabs of quotes from the sex industry as to why there should be no restrictions, no limits at all uh, to what anyone, including children, should be able to access online. So we're actually a bit nervous that we may lose this very minimum sort of bottom line thing that should happen. There's this one small obstacle in the way of children at least accessing this content. So we're not sure uh, where that is going to go. As often happens in Australia, any good initiatives are steamrolled by the very powerful uh, sex lobby, sex <coughs> industry lobby, uh, porn industry, sex and porn industry lobby. But, you know, we do uh, press on. We also are involved in education in schools. And I can tell you that the stories are getting worse, and they're getting worse younger. So I have girls who are in primary school, we're talking 9, 10, 11, telling me that boys expect to choke them. Girls, little girls telling me, he went for my throat, he put his hands around my neck, and they are talking about boys who are 10, 11, 12. And more stories now of girls telling me that boys are threatening to rape them or to rape their mothers and sisters if they don't send naked pictures. Now these children are 12 and 13 years of age, and this is, this is, you know, what you're saying is so true. We are breeding a generation of sociopaths. That is what's happening. We are breeding a generation of boys who are uh, groomed in misogynistic behavior. Uh, they are groomed in entitlement. Uh, porn has put that pre-existing male entitlement on steroids. A big phenomenon we've documented in Australia is the rise of sexual moaning and groaning at girls. And this is happening to girls in primary school. I'm now being asked to speak on these issues in primary schools in Australia. Uh, girls telling us, uh, for example, uh, that if they don't uh, send naked pictures, boys say to them, we're gonna rape your mothers and your sisters. And I met three girls last month who sent pictures because they thought they were saving their mothers and their sisters from rape. Boys telling girls, if you don't send me pictures, I'm going to kill myself. I spoke to a 12-year-old girl who sent a picture because she thought she was saving an 18-year-old male's life. These are normal stories. These are the stories that I hear in Australian schools every day. A teacher told me recently that she overheard a 12-year-old boy talking to another 12-year-old boy. And the first 12-year-old boy asked the second boy, how do you know when you're having sex? And the second boy said, when she starts to cry. And I can't give you a better exhibit A of where we are at as a society. This descent into hell that porn has taken us to. That little boys think that it is normal to inflict pain on women and girls. So that's what sexuality looks like. What, what a tragedy for this generation. How will they learn about true intimacy, connection, mutuality, um, giving, you know, let alone love. Uh, even the girls I speak to expect that sex would be painful, that it would hurt. They don't expect pleasure or enjoyment or anything anything like that. Uh, girl, teachers telling me, female teachers telling me they're propositioned daily by boys. They tell me that boys try to take photos under the desk, up their skirts, down their blouses. I speak to more female teachers telling me they are leaving teaching. But they say, we didn't go into teaching to be sexually harassed every day. We used to love teaching. Now we hate it. And so we're losing a whole lot of really good female teachers uh, because of this. So there's some of the stories that we document, we gather them, uh, we lobby, we advocate, we run uh, campaigns, we write our books, and we're, you know, we are doing what we can uh, to stand up to the predatory multi-billion dollar global porn industry. Uh, what you say about young people is true, they're recognising porn is toxic to them, it is harmful to them and more young people are resisting porn. Some of the global movements against porn now are being led by young people, which I think is a sign of hope, uh, because if this you know, new generation resists it, we, we might get somewhere. And Nat, I love what you said, you know, we resist. We just continue to resist, we do what we can. History will show that we tried, and I'm so grateful for all of you for filling this room up and showing you care about this issue and you want to see some change. Uh, let's all be part of that change together. Thank you so much.